Hey guys, so uh, we're going to work with some theoretical probability today. Um, judging from some emails I got about the theoretical uh, probability sample space assignment in Google Classroom that I gave last week, I think people are still a little bit confused about the difference between experimental probability and theoretical probability and like how we calculate or um, like get these probabilities when we want them. Um, the easiest way I can explain it is like you would learn you would learn it really easy if we were in the classroom because if we were in the classroom and I said okay we're gonna do some experimental probability then I would literally be like handing you some dice or or some spinners to spin or some coins to flip or you'd be like tossing something and like keeping tallies of data you'd be like physically doing something because you have to physically do stuff in order to get experimental probabilities you have to do the experiment Theoretical probabilities, on the other hand, you don't physically do anything. Like, theoretical probabilities are all done with, like, calculators and paper and pencil and in the book and stuff like that. It's all in theory. You figure it out in your head. So, the assignment last week for writing out the sample space for that theoretical probability um, chance experiment I, I typed up... Um, you weren't supposed to actually be like pulling some blue cubes and red cubes and green cubes out of a bag. You were supposed to just be thinking of all the different possibilities of what could happen if you did pull those um, cubes out of the bag. That's that's theoretical probability. And we're going to do some more theoretical with um, dice rolling. So dice rolling is probably the most classic example of probability that like a mathematician or a statistician, someone who works with statistics, can study because it's used for so many things, right? So many games that we play, like board games or other types of games like Magic the Gathering or uh, Dungeons and Dragons, all these different things, um, they, they use dice as a component to figure out how far your, your piece is going to move on the board or how strong your hit is going to be or whatever. Um, and also people gamble with them too, right? Like, um, you know, that that's all about odds or probability when people bet money on what numbers the dice will come up and that sort of thing. So, you know, when it comes to probability, there's not much better to, to study than dice. And so what we're going to look at is the different probabilities of getting certain sums when you roll two dice. So like, you know, when you roll two dice and it comes up a two and a five and you add it up and you call that a seven, that's what we're looking at is what's the, what's the probability of you know, rolling a 12 versus rolling a 3 versus rolling a 9 or whatever. And so the first um, step in getting this theoretical probability is listing out... Sorry, that's an annoying sound I'm making right now. Okay. Um, the first step in getting this theoretical probability is listing out the sample space. Okay, and that's what we're going to do in all these tables that I have in this... Um, sheet in front of me that you would have if we were in the classroom you'd be filling this out so the sample space just means what's all the different ways that the dice could come up if we rolled them and in each of these like smaller parts of this overall thing there's we're gonna list six possible outcomes and what could happen with the first die in each one the, the singular of dice is die um, so what could happen with the first die is already filled out for all these these are all the possibilities where the first die comes up one. Well, the first die could come up one and the second die could also come up one. The first die could come up one and the second die could come up two. And then the first die could come up one and the second die could come up three. And hopefully you're kind of starting to get the pattern. The second die could come up a four, the second die could come up a five, and the second die could come up a six. So these are the six possibilities that could happen once the first die comes up one. And then we're just going to go through that same exact pattern for all the possibilities or different outcomes that could happen if the first die comes up a two, and then all the different outcomes that could happen if the first die comes up a three, etc., etc. And this is actually really, really fast. All we're going to do is list out, okay, if the first die comes up two, well, the second die could come up one, it could come up two, it could come up three, four, five, or six. And then this box, if the first die comes up a three, well, the second die could come up a one, a two, three, four, five, or six. And we're just going to do that same thing 
in, for all the different possibilities of what could happen with the, fir the first die. So in this box, the first die always comes up a four, but the second die could be one, two, three, four, five, six. This is very systematic and like routine or pattern based. And that's the best way to list out these sample spaces. If you do it in a very pattern based sort of methodical way like this, then you're less likely to, to mess up, to like, you know, accidentally forget a certain outcome or like, or miss some or, or like double write, double write them, like write the same outcome twice on accident, which could mess your whole thing up. So we do it very strategically and methodically like this. And so now we have the 36 different outcomes that could happen when you roll two dice um, listed out here. The first die has six different ways it could come up, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the second die has six ways it could come up, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you take the six possible outcomes from the first die and multiply it by the six possible outcomes in the second die, you get 36. And that's how many different outcomes we have here, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36. Now we're gonna fill out the sum boxes here. This is what the two die, two dice add up to, uh, which is what we really actually care about. We care about these sums. All right, so um, I'm gonna do these all in black, that way they're very bold and easy for you to see. And there's a pattern to this too. You'll see it pretty quick. So these two dies are uh, one and one, so they add up to two. This is one and two, so they add up to three. This is one and three, so they add up to four. These numbers are always gonna go up by one because the, the number that I wrote in the second die box is one bigger each time while the first die is staying the same. So this is gonna go two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if you roll a one on the first die, then the only possibilities for the sum at that point are two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then if you roll a two on the first die and then a one, you get a three. And then I know that the second die number is just gonna go up by one each time, while the first die number stays the same. So two plus two is four, the next one's five, this one's six, seven, and eight. It's the exact same pattern as the, the sums in the box before, except one bigger, right? Where I wrote two, now it's three. Where I wrote three, now it's four. And that's because this number is one bigger than it was over here. And so the pattern starts to get kind of clear, right? This one was three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one's gonna be four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Like everything's one bigger than it was over here. And so for, for this box where the first die always comes at four, the sums will be one bigger than they were here. So it'll be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And then over here, where the first die always comes up a five, the lowest thing you could get for your sum is a six, and then seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And the last one where the first die comes up six, you can get seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. All right, so there's all of our different sum outcome possibilities when rolling two dice. All right, and so now the first question is which sum appeared most frequently? Okay, so we literally just go count. Which one is comes up the most? Is it two? Well, I've got a two for the sum here, and I don't have a two anywhere else in the sum boxes. I'm only looking at sums right now. So this box here, or column I should say, this column here, I'm looking at the sums. That's what I care about. It's definitely not two. Well, it actually turns out that it's seven. Because I have a seven right here. I wonder if I've got a seven right here, and a seven here, and a seven here, 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 and here. Seven is the only number that no matter what you roll for your first die, you still have a possibility to get six. I mean, sorry, seven. For all of the other sums, like an eight, you can't get an eight if you rolled a one on the first die. And so eight isn't gonna come up as much as seven. And like a four, well, you can't get a four if the first die you rolled was a five. You're already like higher than four, right? Seven is really nice because it's right in the middle and you can make, make it with um, a lot of different dice combinations. 
Okay, so which sum appeared the least frequently? Well, two only comes up one, one time because you have to roll a one and a one to get it. And 12 also only comes up one time way down here because you have to roll a six and a six to get it. So I would say the least is like a tie between two and 12. And so which sum do you think has the highest probability of being rolled? Well, it's gonna be the sevens because the sevens have more uh, outcome possibilities. There are more like ways to create a seven given two dice than any other possible sum. Which sum do you think has the lowest probability of being rolled? Well, it's gonna be these two here, the ones that only have one unique outcome that creates them. You have to get a six and a six for a 12 and a one and one for a two. So two and 12 will be the ones that have the least probability. All right, so now we can use this sample space that we listed out to actually calculate the theoretical outcomes of uh, getting any of these sums. And what it's gonna be is it's gonna be how many different ways can you create the sum divided by 36, because there's 36 unique ways that the two dice can come up when you roll them. So I'm gonna fill in these boxes here with the number of times that each sum appears. So across the top here it says sum and then two. So I wanna count how many times can I, or how many different ways are there for me to create a sum of two when rolling two dice? And there's only one. It's just this one way here where if I roll a one and a one. So I'm gonna put one for the number of unique outcomes that create a two, it's one. And then now I'm gonna do three. How many unique ways are there for me to create a three given two dice? And there's two different ways. There's one here and there's one here. And that's if I roll a one, two, and a two, one. And those are con con considered different. Even though it, like it would look the same if you rolled it, a two, one, or a one, two, because the, the two and the one have switched positions on the dice, those are considered unique, different outcomes. So there's two ways to get three. Okay, now how many ways are there to come up with a four? I see one, two, three different ways to come up with a four. How many different ways are there to come up with five? I see one, two, three, four different ways to make five. How many different ways are there to make six? One, two, three, four, five. There's five different ways. And how many different ways are there to make seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, how many ways are there to make eight? All right, I'll start over here. One, two, three, four, five. You might already be guessing the pattern. If you are, you're correct. As it went up, the, as the sum went up, the number of possibilities, or the number of outcomes was going up by one each time until it peaked at seven, because seven has the most. And now as we go down, or out, I mean, as the sum goes up, the number of possibilities is going to go down now. There's four ways to make a nine. There are three ways to make a 10. There are two ways to make an 11. And there is one way to make a 12. And so now to find the theoretical probability of getting each one of these sums, we just do the number of ways to get it that I wrote in the boxes here, divided by 36 for each one, because that's how many possible outcomes there are. And we could write these as a fraction, 1 36, 2 36, et cetera. But um, the decimals are gonna be uh, useful for what we're doing on the next page. So I'm gonna crank these out real quick. I was here, one divided by 36, it's 0 0.027. I'll just round that as 0 0.028. So that's about a 3% chance, right? That's a little bit less than 0 0.03. All right, and so uh, two divided by 36, it should be just double this, so it should be like 0 0.056. Yeah, about. Okay, so 0 0.056, okay, and then uh, 3 divided by 36, 0 0.083, okay, and then uh, 4 divided by 36. Luckily, I only have to go half of the way, 0 0.11, because when I get to 6, I know that the pattern's just going to repeat, 
and I can just fill in the boxes from there. So 5 divided by 36 equals 0 0.0. There's no way that's right because it's less than what I did for five, 4 divided by 36. So I must have messed up on there somewhere. So 5 divided by 36. There we go. 0 0.1. We'll call it 0 0.14. It's close enough. And then 6 divided by 36 is going to be 0 0.16 repeating. So we'll call it 0 0.1. 7 just to make our lives easier and then this pattern is just going to repeat see this is 5 out of 36 this is 5 out of 36 so 0.14 and then 4 out of 36 would be the same as this one over here so 0.11 and 3 out of 36 is 0 0.083 and 2 out of 36 is 0 0.056 and 1 out of 36 is 0 0.028 and so it says if you add up all these probabilities what should you get and why well, if you added up all these probabilities, you wouldn't get exactly one because I did all the rounding, but if you added up the exact numbers or if you added up the fractions, you would get one. All of the probabilities add up to one, one, because one equals 100%. And there's a 100% chance that one of these outcomes is going to happen. If you roll uh, two dice, you have to get one of these outcomes. And so all of their, all of their probabilities added up have to be the 100% or probability of one that you will get one of these outcomes. Okay, um, so I want to show you one thing with these numbers that's kind of connected to something you saw in the Bill Nye video last week. I'm gonna take this graph here, and it says estimated probability. That's something we would have done in class if we were together, but we're not. I'm gonna graph the theoretical probability of these dice outcomes. And I want you to see something about the way the graph looks. So down here, you probably just barely see it if it's just barely on the screen. Let me try moving this a little bit. Oh, wait, no, I got a better idea. I'll just fold the paper so I'm not using the top half. There we go. Now you can probably see it much easier. Um, here, down here on the bottom, these will be the sums. So like, you know, get the sum being 2, the sum being 7, 11, etc. And across the y-axis is the, the theoretical probability of getting that sum. And I'm just going to graph this, these numbers that we just got on the previous paper, the, the theoretical probability of each of these sums. So the first one is 0 0.028. So that's lower than 0 0.04, probably, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. We can go about here. And 12 is going to be at the same spot, right? Because 12 and um, uh, 2 have the same probability. 3 and 11 have the same probability. 4 and 10 have the same probability. So uh, that makes things a little bit easier. Okay, so the probability of 3 is uh, 0 0.056. So that'll be about... Uh, here-ish. I know that might be a little too high, but whatever. And so let me graph about the same spot for 11. It'll be about here. Okay, and then for 10, that has a 0 0.083 probability or about 8% chance of pulling, coming up for, for a sum of 4, I should have said. Okay, so 4 is at, it's right at about 0 0.08, so we'll just put it there. And same thing for 10. Okay, and then um, let's see here, a sum of five, yeah, a sum of five has, what did I mess up? Two, three, four, yeah, no. Sum of four. Yeah, I'm, I keep confusing myself because there's the sum numbers up here and then there's the total number of unique outcomes and those two numbers are one off from each other. And that's really messing my brain up right now. Okay, so I want a sum of five, which is this column, <laughs> point one, one. All right. Even though I've done this like 10 times, probably more than 10 times because I do it multiple times every year. It's still confusing to me. 
Okay, so we'll put those about there. All right, and then for sums of six and eight, those both have a 0.14 probability. So we'll graph those real quick, 0.14, oops, that'll be about here-ish. And then lastly, a sum of seven has a 0.17 probability coming up. So that'll be right about here. And now, if you were to like try to sort of draw a, a graph that kind of like curves around these dots, you get this shape thing. And you saw something that looked like this in the Bill Nye video. He called it a bell-shaped curve. And curves like this are made so much when you graph things in statistics and probability because things tend to be near the average or the center of things and you get very fewer results that are like way on the low end of stuff or way on the high end. Like for example, if a teacher gives a test, they expect most of their students to get kind of average scores in the middle and hopefully only a very few students will get really low scores and usually only very few students get super high scores. Data like this is said to be normally distributed. Because normally, most data falls in the middle in the average where you expect it to be, and very few data winds up here on the ends. Like in the Bill Nye video, it was those, those balls were falling through that weird contraption where the balls would fall left and right as they went. Well, most balls had a, a relatively equal number of left bounces and right bounces in that thing as they fell, and that put them toward the center. Only very few balls kept going left, 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 and wound up here because there's a like a lower chance of that happening. And very few balls went right, 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 and landed way over here because there's a lower chance of that happening. You expect them to kind of go left, right, left, right, left, right. And it created this sort of curve naturally. If you ever take a statistics class in college, you'll do nothing but like study these bell-shaped curves and normally distributed data. It's like what it's all about. All right, um, I think that's it for today.